John chapter number 2, and uh, this is not like the service we had last Sunday night. There will be no refreshments at the end of the service, but we're sure glad that you're here. And uh, we need church. We need uh, more church, not less. And I know uh, the temptation in your flesh sometimes is, uh, you know, let's just stay home and rest. And uh, you have to learn to say to your flesh, no, you cannot have your way. Right. And uh, and if I understand right, the older you get, that doesn't change. You still have to keep saying to it, no, you cannot have your way. Remember, Jesus said through the writer in Hebrews that as we see his day approaching, that we're, assemb- we're to assemble together and so much the more, he said. Uh, Not less assembly, but more assembly, more fellowship. And in that fellowship, we always encourage uh, one another. Isn't it an encouraging thing to see our visitors on Sunday morning? Isn't that exciting to see what God is doing? I noticed Sister Owen, as she kind of looked around this morning, I thought to myself, I imagine that's an extreme encouragement to her because she has been at our church when... We were small in number, and we had just a few folks, and they would be praying with us and trying to help us bring people here to church, and I'm, I, I believe this morning she was encouraged uh, in the Lord. I hope that you are also encouraged, and let's pray for our folks that come on Sunday morning. Uh, they'll come back on Sunday evening. Brother Bruce normally does the preaching at Sunday uh, in our Sunday evening service, and he does an excellent job. It's a big help. It'll help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Nobody ought to miss that. And I also want to commend Sunday school to you. It's a good time to sit in the class and study the Word together. Uh, Sunday school used to be a big deal at church. Uh, You won't believe this, but some people used to come for Sunday school, and after that they'd go home. (laughs) They loved Sunday school so much. They had, you know, uh, that was really good. And then they, they wouldn't even stay for the preaching service. Uh, one of our churches uh, in Ohio switched things around. They had church first and then Sunday school. And the reason they that, did that is because people would come to Sunday school and then they'd go home. They'd say, all right, we're going to have church first. If you want to stay for Sunday school, you can. And uh, isn't, it, isn't it amazing how things change? Our Lord hasn't changed. I think what changes our affection towards Him, our desire for spiritual things. We're letting those uh, desires get kind of cold. And the reason we're doing that is so much of the world fills up our mind and our life, and we're not even aware of it. I don't think we even notice how much uh, that we uh, watch the world and listen to the world and it's not that we're going out here and just you know elbows deep into gross immorality and perversion and wickedness it's just the things of this world are very enjoyable they're pleasurable they're attractive to our flesh and before you know it we are we are watching things, not really, maybe not wrong things. I mean, you like watch documentaries on TV, like our Discovery Channel with animals. You know, I love that. Uh, there was a time I was watching uh, the news quite a bit to my wife's irritation. And, and I understand why she would get irritated because she said they're really saying the same thing over and over again every hour. I said, yeah, but it's a different person saying it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and she couldn't stand it, but I thought it was great. And uh, I thank the Lord. He's deli- I think my wife prayed about that. Lord, deliver him from watching the news so much. And the Lord heard and answered her prayer. But it's not just that. It's not just news. It's just so many things. You know, the devil is not stupid. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And he's really good at what he does. Right? Um, 
Someone asked me one time, if Christianity is true, why are there so many different religions in the world? And I said, because Satan's not a dummy. <laughs> right? If you had Christianity and one other, he wouldn't have but one other choice. Reject Christ and have this, right? But it's not Christianity and one other. It's Christianity and a million others. Because he wants to catch somebody somewhere believing something as long as he can get them away from Jesus, he don't matter what it is. To him, right? Atheism, whatever it might be. Islam, uh, Buddhism, whatever. Anything to get them away from Jesus, right? And so he's really wise at that. Well, he's wise at how he operates this world as well. Right? He's got so much stuff out there that can attract you, that, that's enjoyable. And if you're not careful, it can consume your life. And you can just be thinking about it and planning on it. And just, uh, that's all your life is about, is this thing or this, uh, this goal or this aim. And you better be careful. And the section of Scripture that we're going to look at this evening warns us about that. It's in 1 John 2. Look at verses 15 and through 17, and it's a very familiar uh, section of Scripture, but I feel like we need to be reminded of this again this evening. John is writing to fellow Christians, and he says in verse 15 of 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world. And then he adds, neither the things that are in the world. Every once in a while you need to stop. And ask yourself a question. What are the things in the world? You know? How do I love the world? Well, he'll tell us some of those answers in these verses. If any man love the world, he continues in verse 15, notice the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then he adds verse 17, and the world passes away. One of these days it's going to melt with a fervent heat. And the lust or desires thereof. They also are going to come to an end. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen? Amen? And what a great truth. Join me as we have a word of prayer. Father, we need you. Lord, we ask for your help. Lord, you love us. You loved us so much. You gave your only dear son, Jesus, to die on a cross and pay a debt that we owed. And Father, we thank you. We pray for help. Lord, we, we don't really see the world like you see it. We don't feel towards this world the way that you feel toward this world. But often we are attracted to it. We often desire it. Lord, there's so many things in this world that we must do. It's a part of living. But Lord, there's always the temptation to go beyond Your will, to get more involved in things than what we ought to be involved in those things. And we ask You for help this evening. Lord, may You turn our heart away from this world and the things that are in the world. And Lord, help us that we would love You, Lord, and only You, because You're worthy of that. Please help us to say what we need to say this evening in this service so that you would receive the glory that you deserve. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. When you read the Bible, one of the things that you need to understand is that there are three different ways that the word world is used. It's used in the sense of the physical world, this physical world. You'll see this in Acts chapter 17 and verse 24. It says this, God that made the world and all things therein. It's talking about this physical world. 
what we refer to as the world. And the Bible uses it in that sense. Sometimes when you use, come across the word world in the Bible, it's talking about just this physical world that we live in. And then it refers to the people of the world as well. That great verse in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. We're told here not to love the world. And this isn't a contradiction. In John 3.16, God loves the people, all of, all of creation, every person in the world. God loves everybody. Amen? Everywhere. God loves all of humanity. He loves the world. Amen. So it's talking about the people of the world in John 3.16. And then the world as an enemy. Its plans, its pleasures, its pursuits. We find that here in our text in 1 John 2.15. Love not this world system, this world's ways. This world is the community of sinful humanity that is united in rebellion against God. There's something going on. It. And listen, you don't even have to be saved to sense it. You can just tell it just by watching TV and, and seeing how drastically the world is changing and what they're promoting, and you, and you, or you're, I hope that you're amazed, like, yeah, you're amazed that they're able to promote some of the things that they're promoting in our day. And you see a system, and it's organized, and it's pressing it on humanity, and it's demanding that we accept its teaching, and its wickedness, and its evil. Um, it wasn't long ago that they were trying to say that a man and a man could marry and that could be considered marriage. And we said, no. God defined marriage. And he said marriage is between a man and a woman. You can't just redefine it. Well, in their opinion, they can. They're the world. They make their own rules. Right? They have their own ways. They're opposing God's way. Did y'all remember some of the arguments? They warned people, if you redefine marriage, what will it end up being? And, and we said, you know, will you be able to marry animals? And, the, and we were mocked, mocked for saying that. You just changed the definition of marriage, but you know what? People are marrying animals now. Look it up. Go online. You'll even find where a woman married a tree. Go online, you'll find it. You'll find it. I'm not telling you a story. Married a tree. How in the world do you marry a tree? How did the tree say, I do? When did he give the ring? I mean, you know. And you say, preacher, that's crazy. That's the world. And now, they're pushing these transgender issues. They want boys to go into little girls' dressing rooms and change in those dressing rooms. And by the way, that uh, boy could say uh, that his gender is fluid. He can be a boy and then go in the dressing room and be a girl, and then as soon as he walks out, he can be a boy again. And nobody can challenge him on that because they try to get you to believe gender is fluid. Is that right or not? and more vile and more wicked than homosexuality and these men dressing like women and women dressing like men is now they're having children that are being mutilated for these reasons. Four and five and six year olds are having surgeries that are permanent, life transforming surgeries are taking pills that affect them for the rest of their life. A few years ago, we would have said that's child abuse. Right? And in my opinion, it's still child abuse. I think any doctor that would perform a surgery on somebody less than 18 years of old in, that, in those areas should be arrested and thrown in jail. Amen. That's wrong. That's immoral. That's wicked. I mean, we won't even let somebody drink alcohol until they get to 21, and yet we're letting five-year-olds 
tell us that they're either a boy or a girl. How many of you ever had a child think that he was a donkey or a horse for a while? <laughs> I mean, their imagination's wild. Are you going to put a saddle on their back? <laughs> no, you're going to say, okay, we've got to help him understand he's not that. <laughs> you're not going to cater to it, are you? That's this world, it's system. It's in rebellion against God. It's like Babel of old in Genesis chapter 11. After the flood, men were told to disperse throughout the earth. But they gathered together in one city. And they said, we're going to make the laws. We're going to say what's right and wrong. We don't need God. We'll do our own thing. And that's when God sent the diversity of languages in the earth and he scattered them across the face of the earth. He said, I'm not going to allow that. And that's been the world's desire for a long time, to live without God. And so what they have is they have some seductive things that they use to help you become a part of their wicked plans. The lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Listen to the world's heart in Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. This is their attitude. The kings of the earth set themselves. It, it's, and you read that, it seems like they put themselves in these positions. God didn't put them there. They put themselves there. They set themselves, uh, the psalmist writes. And the rulers take counsel together. What do we want to do? How do we want the world to run? What do we think is right? What do we think is wrong? Notice they take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed or Messiah saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We don't have to live the way God said that we had to live in His Word, which is really foolish. Yes, it is. Amen? Because only God is the all-knowing, all-wise, eternal God. Paul wrote about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says, where in times past, even those of us who are saved now, a part of Christ and a part of His church, we all lived in the world before, right? We were part of that. That system of rebellion against God, doing our own thing. And Paul includes himself in this in Ephesians chapter 2. Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Honestly, who would encourage a little child to go and watch a man dress up like a woman and do sexual gyrations in front of of those children. Years ago, they would have been put in jail for that. Y'all, Have y'all seen that? They're taking their kids to bars and they're letting these uh, men dressed like women dance in very vulgar ways and even putting, even getting the kids to put dollar bills in their waistbands. Now how come nobody's arrested for that? Right? It's, they got video evidence of it, brother. And yet the world, they're looking at that and they're, they're applauding that. That's, that tells you there's a spirit of rebellion that's working in their hearts, right? Yes. There's an evil, satanic spirit that's at work in this world. And he goes on to say in verse 3 of Ephesians 2, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, we all live this way. That's how we conducted ourselves. In the lust of our flesh. And then he adds, fulfilling, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. So notice what the world wants. What is it that they want? Go back to 1 John 2.15. They want your love. That's what the world wants. It wants your love. Yes, yes. So 
So John says, love not the world. And that's what the world wants. It wants your affection. It wants your uh, praise. It wants your approval. It wants you to accept it, to embrace it. That's what the world wants. Notice in verse 15 it says, if any man love the world. So that means there's some people that are attracted to it at least, right? Because he said, if any man love the world, there's some people out there, and Paul said we all used to love it, right? There was a time before we met Christ, we all enjoyed the things of this world, and we lived for this world. Then we met Christ, and he delivered us from that. And now John's writing and says, don't you love the world? Don't you fall in love with this current evil world? If any man love the world, clearly indicates that some do. At times, we know ourselves that the world even today catches our eye. Right? I mean, there's always a danger that you can be seduced by this world. Um, we, I called on a man one time to pray at our church service, and I learned a lesson from that. From that before I called on people to pray, now I usually ask them, hey, you mind if I ask you to pray at the church? <laughs> And uh, so the next service, he didn't come. The next service, he didn't come. And I found out through his family, he was really upset with me. And I said, well, why is he upset? He said, well, he's not even a Christian. I said, he said he was. Y'all said he was. So I went over to his house, and I said, look, I understand you're upset. He said, yeah. I said, well, you said you were a Christian. Your mom said you were. He said, no, I've never been saved. So I took the Bible and showed him how he could trust Christ to be saved. And there in his home, he bowed his head and trusted Christ. He started coming to church, and he was doing so well. We had a revival meeting uh, with uh, Brother Dale Burden. And during that revival, he came and hit the altar, hit the altar. Hit the altar. He's giving up sin. I thought, man, this guy's going to really grow and serve the Lord. Well, he uh, is a trim carpenter and he got a contract out the beach, some apartments, and he signed the contract, and the contract said you have to have it done at this certain date. And so he started missing a lot of church. I went to visit him at his house and I said, listen, you. You're not doing well. You're missing a lot of church. It's going to hinder you spiritually. He said, yeah, but preacher, I've got this contract and I have got to get this finished. If I don't get it finished, I'm going to be penalized. I said, listen, you already signed the previous contract. You already signed on the dotted line to Jesus and you said, I'm going to be faithful to church. I'm going to watch out for my spiritual well-being. I'm going to make sure that's the priority. And listen, I, I, I wish the, the story turned from there, but it didn't. It only got worse until he got back to doing the same old things he did before he met Jesus. And some of you know people that have been seduced by the, this world in that same way, don't you? And that's what it wants constantly, your love. It's like an adulterous woman at work, always flirting with a married man. Right? She knows he's married. She knows he belongs to someone else. But she's still putting out some vibes, hoping that he's going to bite. And that's the way the world does all the time. Is that right or not? By the way, that's, that, is, that is biblically solid truth. Remember what James said in the book of James chapter 4? James chapter 4, if you go to Hebrews, right after the book of Hebrews, you'll find James chapter 4. I want you to listen to these words. He says in James chapter 4, verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members. By the way, he's writing to Christians here. You'll see that in a little bit. 
You lust or desire and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss or wrongly that you may consume it upon your own desires. Lord, help me win the lottery because you want wealth and what you think it might bring. That's why you're praying to win the lottery. But notice verse 4. If you're there, this is an important verse. He says, You adulterers and adulteresses Know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. He said you cannot hold the hand of Jesus and the hand of the world. You can't marry Jesus and then be found out there flirting with the world. If a husband found his wife or wife found the husband doing that, it would make them outraged. And it should, right? Amen. Well, our Lord's none to please with our looking at the world with desires either, is He? Amen. And that's what the world's working for all the time to try to seduce you. It's always offering these things. Things. Here's a business opportunity. Before you know it, man, you're just... You know, you're just going that way because there's a potential to make a lot of money. Well, it's easy to get wrapped up in that, isn't it? Be on guard against that. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're told about a, a fellow worker with the Apostle Paul. Could you imagine living back in Paul's day and going on missionary journeys with him and listening to preaching and telling others about Jesus? And Demas was a, a co-worker he was a missionary, a co-missionary with the Apostle Paul. And he's, he's mentioned three times in the New Testament. He's mentioned as a co-worker, and then he's just mentioned Demas. And then the last time he's mentioned is in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, and the Bible says this, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. He said, Demas didn't help me no more. We're not told what got a hold of Demas's heart. We're not told what turned him away from the mission field. We're not told what seduced him to love the world. We're just told that he fell in love with the world. It may have been cash or camels or castles. You know. No telling what it is. But the devil has a lot of little trinkets to hold out there. Right? You better be on guard against it and make sure that's not the, the, the affection of your heart. That's not the pursuit of your life. Make sure you're doing the will of God. By the way, the will of God is not always up. The will of God is not always more. Amen? One of the most helpful sermons I heard was when Brother Johnny Pike preached about the simple Christian life. And he exhorted us in that sermon to look at life differently. Not about trying to get a bunch of stuff and have a lot of toys, but to live a simple life that's completely sold out to Christ. In other words, you don't need a bigger home. You might can go from the three-bedroom down to a one-bedroom. Amen? Amen? You know, people don't even think about that in our day. You might not need a car that will haul seven. Right? You may not need a car that hauls that many people. You might could buy a smaller car. And on and on, the choices that we could make to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to be sucked in to this world's system and its ways of doing things. Uh, Jenny listens uh, almost as religiously to Dave Ramsey. How many of you ever know Dave Ramsey? He's a financial advisor. And uh, his ways is our biblical ways. And so it's, it's totally contrary to the advice that you'd get in the world. 
He advises us to pay off all your debt. Amen? And how many Christians are working for that to be their goal? I want to be debt free, not debt free so I can just now put all my money in the bank. Debt free so I can live for God. Debt free so I can be more about my Father's business. Amen? So Demas loved this present world. Something there got his eyes off of Jesus. In Joshua chapter 7, we're, t- we're told the story of a man named Achan. Yes, yes. And Achan went into uh, Jericho. And he was told when you go into Jericho, they're fighting, conquering the promised land. He said when you go into Jericho, nobody touch any of the spoils of war. No, don't touch the silver. Don't touch the gold. That all belongs to God. Don't put your hands on it. Amen. And Achan was going through there and he said, I saw a goodly Babylonian garment. In other words, he said, I, I saw a suit that was one of the most expensive suits I ever saw in my life and it fit me. It was my size. And he said, if I just take this suit, ain't nobody going to know anything about it. And when he went to get the suit, he saw 200 shekels of silver. He said, well, since I'm getting the suit, I might as well get some spare change to go with it. And then when he went to get the silver, he found 50 shekels weight of wedge of gold, and he got the gold as well. You see how he, he's fighting, he's doing what's right, he's busy about God's work, he's obeying God. By faith, they've conquered Jericho. Everything's, I mean, it's going well. All of a sudden, here's a, here's a garment, it just happens to be your size. Okay. Yeah. Instead of him saying, No, God said, the world put its hooks in. And by the way, if you want to read that story, it's a sad ending to that story. It cost him everything. Everything. In Hebrews chapter 11, we have the faith chapter. Men and women who didn't live for this world, but they lived for the world to come. By the way, I encourage all of y'all to go back and reread Hebrews chapter 11 to help you. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. (laughs) He wasn't looking for a temporal dwelling place in this world. He was looking for that heavenly city. That's where he had his eyes fixed on. He was a man of faith. But Hebrews chapter 11 tells us about Moses. Remember when Moses was a little baby, they were commanded to kill all the boys, to throw them in the river and let them perish. Well, Mama put little Moses in an ark, laid him in the river, and told her daughter, watch over him, make sure he's safe, yeah. that he comes no harm. And she put him in the river, and Pharaoh's daughter went out to take a bath, and he heard the little baby crying, and it, it just stole Pharaoh's uh, daughter's heart, and Pharaoh took, daughters took that uh, Moses home and raised Moses. Yeah, like that she was his own child. Moses come to a time, though, he had to make a choice between the world, the world, and living for God. And by the way, this was a big choice. He could have been considered Pharaoh's family. Pharaoh's daughter's son. There's no telling what he would have benefited from that. There's no telling how much wealth that he would have gained from that, right? Right? Nonetheless, the wickedness and sins that he could have gotten involved in just because he wanted to live that way. But you know what the Bible says about Moses? It said he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Listen, sin is always a very short season. It don't last long. Amen? 
And the world's constantly trying to get you to love it. To fall in love with it. And by the way, the, I, I, the world does this. It rewards those that fall in love with it. That's true, isn't it? Uh, you might remember the story of Lot, Abraham's son. And they had to divide because their cattle were so great. And Lot, Abraham said, you choose which way you want to go, right or left. You choose the right, I'll go the left. If you choose the left, I'll go right. And Lot looked at the grass that was high and the well-watered plain at, that was directed towards Sodom and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, Lot's in the city and he's in the gates of the city. Now what the gates of the city means is it wasn't that he was a porter. It means that he had some kind of political position. He moved into Sodom and he got a place on the city council. But his family was destroyed because of it. His testimony was ruined over it. Amen? Did it help him at all? No. Worst decision he ever made in his entire life. Amen? And so John, that great uh, lover of Christ, says, let me tell you about the world's way. He said there are three things to watch out for. And he said, and I'm going to use the word desire because we use that word more than lust. When we use the word lust, a lot of times we think, you know, lusting towards the opposite sex, but it's the word desire is really what it's trying to get us to see. You're wanting something. You're desiring it. And, and John said, watch out for these three danger areas. The lust of the flesh, the desires of this old flesh, the desires of these eyes, and then he said, watch out also for the pride of life. And by the way, many have been ruined in these three areas. You want to know how powerful it is? Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when Eve was being tempted by the devil. And you'll see clearly that he used the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life to seduce her into rebelling against God. God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Every other tree in the garden, you can eat as much as you want. Enjoy it. But that one tree, don't touch it. If you touch it, if you eat the day you eat thereof, you're going to die. And Satan comes in and says, well, you know, God really don't want you to have that because he knows it will make you like God. And she looked at the tree again and she said, you know, it is good for food. Desire of the flesh. You know, it is pleasant to the eyes. Right? I mean, it's attractive fruit as well. And then she said, and it's going to make me wise. Brother John, you got a question, Brother John? Yes, sir. What is that? Where did evil come from? Evil? Yes. Evil came from Satan, first of all, as he rebelled against God, but then it came when men chose not to do God's will. Satan created evil? No, Satan tempted man, and man's rebellion caused evil. Well, who created evil then? Well, it's, it's, evil is created when we refuse to do God's will. That's what evil is. Evil is when man refuses to do God's will. God didn't create evil, but when we, refuse, when we rebel, that's evil. When we make that choice not to do God's will, that's evil. He knows everything, right. No, this is what God did. He made it where man could have a free choice. If God didn't give man a free choice, this is how God would have had to make us. Robots. Right? We don't have no choice whatsoever. We do this. Robot, robot, robot. And I don't know about you, but I rejoice in the fact that Brenda loves me at her own free will. Amen. I can't force her to love me. Uh, I can't make her love me. I can't threaten her into loving me. She loves me. I don't know why she loves me, but 
She loved me of her own free will. And I love her of my own free will. And God wants you to love Him because you choose to love Him as well. Not because He forced you to. And that's why that tree is there. God gave us the, the freedom to choose to love Him or choose to love ourselves. And Adam and Eve chose to love themselves and not do what God said do. How can a tree be called a tree of good and evil? It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when man ate of that tree, uh, when man ate of that tree, he, he, he immediately learned what was good and what was evil. He, he had the knowledge now, not the power to do it, but he had the knowledge of good and evil. So it's not that this tree you know, had a special fruit on it that says if you eat this you get all this kind of wisdom, but because he rebelled he experienced something that he was God didn't, really didn't want him to experience. But he knew he would if he ate of that tree. And that's why he said, don't eat it. And so the choice was made, but, but she, she fell in the same trap that we all fall into. And by the way, there are many trees that are out there in life, right? And there's the, the lust of the flesh. These are desires that come from the internal pressure. Wants of the body. By the way, we need food and we need water and we need rest. But we need to be careful that we get all that our body needs in the will of God. Because we can go outside of that will and we could be giving in to the world and loving the world. So easy to overeat or oversleep or have sex outside of marriage or other physical pleasures. Remember, Jesus promised to meet all of our needs in Matthew chapter 6. So I know what your needs are. If you'll put me first, I'll meet them. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9... I buffet my body. Now, he did, that's not going down to Golden Corral and getting in the buffet. He said, I beat it up. I beat my body up and I put it under me and I bring it into subjection. And by the way, we're called to do that with our physical bodies as well. We can't just let them... Have you experienced this when you, you, know, when you were little and you went to the store and you wanted Mama to buy you a candy bar and she said no, it kind of just broke your heart. But you know, when you get older and you got the money, you can buy that candy bar if you want to. <laughs> there ain't nobody tell you no but yourself. On our trip, uh, we stopped at a, a Cracker Barrel. But I'm not going to tell you who it was, but one of our party, and it's not, it wasn't me or Brenda, so... One of our party, instead of going to Cracker Bell, saw a shop that sold chocolate. And he was of the male gender. So that might limit, I mean, some of you might figure out who this is out. And so instead of eating a meal and vegetables, guess what he did? He went straight to the chocolate shop. Got him a box of chocolate, got him some ice cream. We come back, he's eating ice cream, we got a little box of chocolate. I'm like, what is this? And he said that. He said, when I was little, he said, sometimes they say, you can't, he said, now that I'm old, I'll get what I want and what I like. But that's not always the best thing to do, is it? <laughs> Be careful about the flesh and its desires. They can get inflamed. They can get out of control. You've got to guard against that. That's why sometimes it's good to fast. It's good just to say to yourself, no. By way of fasting, sometimes it doesn't have to be food. It can be something else. Um, speaking of this desires of the eye, you might want to fast from TV or YouTube or Facebook. You know how I many people? Have you been to a doctor's appointment lately? Anybody been to a doctor's appointment? Have you noticed... Everybody in there is doing this. Nobody's talking. They're all doing this. And probably most of them are on Facebook. Who posted 
the last thing lately. So watch out for the desires of the flesh. Watch out for the desires of the eyes. These are those desires that are external, stirred by external objects. Desire of the eyes, materialism, idolizing possessions. We, we all are tempted in these areas. Excessive buying. I mean, you would think that some people would get to a point and they'd say, okay, that's enough. Who was this? The lady that was in, like, was it Nicaragua or someplace that had just an ungodly number of shoes in her closet? Anybody remember that story? I mean, it was like 2,000 pairs. I mean, it was just an un- ungodly. You'll never wear all those shoes. In the Philippines. You know, that, that is the lust of the eyes. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. And Listen, you need to keep that in check. We're, we're entering the Christmas season. Right? And be careful. Guard against it. Sometimes if you want something, purposely say to yourself, no, I'm attracted to it. I want that, but I'm not going to give in to that. Think about, I mean, just iPhones. I mean, how many updates can they do with uh, on iPhones? Right? What are they on now? iPhone what? Eighty or you know? They had iPhone and iPhone one and two. What are they on now? Anybody know? Fourteen. Is it really? I didn't know it was that much. Yeah. All, all, more and more and more. You're like, what, what else are you going to add this year that you didn't have last year? But you know what people do? They line up to be first. And a part of that's trying to lie. What you got? I got the new I-14. You see how this world, this system, it just sucks you in. And if you're not careful, you'll get the, you'll get, you know, the same thing. You have that same desires. Having to wear clothes that are a certain make. Boy, these people make these clothes. I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm probably backwards in this area, but I've never bought clothes looking at the who made it. But some people, they want the name brand things. They want everybody to know, I'm wearing the name brand. Those jeans are going to rip like any other pair. You get paint on them, they're going to stain like any other pair. Amen? Sometimes it is wiser to buy things that last longer. I'm not saying always buy the cheapest thing out there, but you, you need to be careful about the desire of these eyes. We, we don't ever seem to have it. I mean, these eyes are never satisfied, right? Someone has a boat. Now they, want, they need another boat and a bigger boat. and a, you know, just a, Well, mine's kind of small. Well, you've got seven <laughs> engines on it already. I mean, how many more do you need? You know, be careful, Christians. We are sucked into that. The 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 thing that's hurting Christianity more than anything else in America today is our materialism, our covetousness, our desire for things. Let me close. I I don't know where the pride of life. Let me quickly touch on this. I don't want to leave that. That's the desire uh, desire to be something apart from God's will. That mainly appeals to our spirit. This is where we want people to think well of us. We don't take pride, and I'm doing this in the the good sense, of where God has placed us in life. We're not happy God put me here. We want a title or position that we think the world would say, oh, man, I'm so glad you got that. And by the way, we're all tempted in these areas. You know what pastors talk about when they get together? And I don't—I hate reporting this to you. It's not good. It's bad. But they say, what's your attendance and how much money did you bring in? Isn't that sad? You know why they ask those two questions? They're, they're wondering your measure of success. 
You know what's like all across America and other places, there are churches that have small groups that are desperately needing a godly pastor to come in and help them. But when that pastor contacts that church and he sees there's not much money there, I may have to get a job and serve there as a pastor and work. And by the way, that's a noble thing to do as well. Amen? Amen. I may have to get a job and work there and they can't take care of me. And so they look for a place that will. That's dangerous. And by the way, our churches are infested with that. And you better watch out for it yourself. Could you be happy being a garbage man? If you know that's yeah, if you know that's God's will. That's where God wants me. He put me here. I'm right where God wants me to be. By the way, my dad used to do that. He used to deliver papers. Uh, my my dad my dad was a man's man. But he would do any job necessary to take care of his family. Be careful. The pride of life will lead you to try to control other people. You'll be arrogant. Ambition is not wrong as long as it's spiritual ambition. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3, if you desire the office of the bishop, you desire a good thing. That's a good desire. I want to be all for Christ that I can be. Not so people pat me on the back, but so that Jesus gets the glory. I want to grow in my likeness to Christ. That's a great desire. I want to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. That's a great desire. Amen? Amen. But be careful that your pride don't start seeking things just to elevate self. To lift you up. Pride brings a lot of problems. Amen? Amen? Notice quickly, we were close and look at verse 17. This is what's so critical. Remember this. Please remember this. Everything in this world will come to naught. It's not going to last. It's going to die. It's going to pass away. It's going to end. Everything down here. One day, you're going to die. Amen? When we die, we don't take anything with us. You can't take suitcases of gold in heaven. When do you no good when you get there anyway? Because the streets are, are full of um, gold. I mean, they, they'd be saying, "Why are you carrying pennies around with you for?" <laughs> you know, that don't impress us up here. <laughs> I mean, we walk on that stuff here. Oh, you got some more pavement? Just put it over there in the corner. <laughs> this world is not going to last. Jesus said, "Lay up treasures in heaven." There's a greater reason to live. There's a greater goal to live. And that's for Christ, for things that will make an eternal difference. Amen? Amen. The world passes away, and notice this next, these next three words, or four words, excuse me, and the lust thereof. And the lust, all these desires one day will come to an end as well. Amen? Amen. But please hear me as we close this, this next little phrase. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that good? Amen. You're going to spend your wills trying to get things and satisfy your flesh. And your eyes are going to want more and more and more. You're going to be prideful, offended so easily, upset over the smallest of things. And here is a, a promise of everlasting joy, of a life that really matters. Doing the will of God, you will abide forever. We, we, as Christians, we've got to elevate our goals, right? We, we've got to start paying attention to, am I being seduced by my fleshly cravings? Am I being seduced by just wanting this, wanting this, and having to see this? Is pride driving my life in a direction that's contrary to God's will? Then I need to put the brakes on. Amen? Amen. And get back to Jesus and say, Jesus, what do you want with me? Your will is always best. 
And I'd rather serve you than do anything else I can think of in this world. Amen? Amen. And that's how, that's, that's all, that should be all of our hearts as well, right? Yeah. May the Lord help that to be true.